The book of Genesis does indeed teach us. Abraham took another wife named Keturah. Genesis 25, 1. After the death of Sarah, his first wife, the patriarch, remarried Keturah, who bore him six sons. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Genesis 25, 2. This is all that the Bible directly reveals to us about this woman who shared the last years of Abraham's life, but her exact status is debated. Was she really his wife or just his concubine? In the book of Chronicles, she is indeed described as a concubine. The sons of Keturah, Abraham's concubine. 1 Chronicles 132. Now, in biblical tradition, the concubine, while not being a lawful wife, maintained an ongoing exclusive relationship with a man, bore him children but remained of inferior status to the real wife. It therefore seems that Keturah began as Abraham's concubine before later being considered his wife, which would explain the double mention in scripture. In any case, it is clear that she did not have the same prestige and dignity in the eyes of the chosen people as Sarah did. The Bible does not grant her the same honor as Sarah, the true matriarch of Abraham's lineage. Let us listen to what the Apostle Peter says about Sarah. Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. 1 Peter 3, 6 Sarah remains the biblical model of a wife according to God's heart, full of valor and faith. Nothing of the kind is said about the unassuming Keturah. Yet despite her lowly status as a second-rank wife, Keturah participated in God's providential plan by giving birth to Abraham's six sons. And these sons would become the ancestors of Arab tribes established east of the land of Israel. Thus, Keturah's descendants are intimately intertwined with the history of the chosen people. In particular, Scripture tells us that the tribe of Midianites originated with the son Midian born to Keturah. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Hanok, Abida, and Eldar. All these were descendants of Keturah, Genesis 25, 4. This Midianite tribe would have close ties to Israel since fleeing Egypt. Moses would find refuge in the land of Midian. Now Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Exodus 2.15 There he would meet Zipporah, daughter of the Midianite priest, who would become his wife. Thus, Keturah's descendants are directly intertwined with the history of the chosen people and its beginnings. The unassuming Keturah teaches us an important lesson. In God's mysterious plan, each person has a precise role to play, however modest their condition or abilities may seem. Even those who appear relegated to the background of history contribute to the fulfillment of God's providential will. Nothing is ever negligible or secondary in the eyes of the Lord. Let us listen to what the Apostle Paul says. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. 1 Corinthians 1 27, 28 Yes, God's plan is often accomplished through the little ones, the weak, those the world does not see, like Keturah welcoming Abraham and giving birth to the sons of the divine promise. We are all called to humbly and confidently welcome the unique role that the Lord wants to entrust to us. Nothing happens by chance in the history of salvation. Everyone is precious in God's sight and called to serve in their place the coming of his kingdom of love. Certainly in Keturah's image, we might sometimes feel relegated to the background, ignored or undervalued in the eyes of men. But let us keep our eyes fixed on Christ. He who made himself the servant of all reveals to us the infinite value of every act of love accomplished in humility and self-giving. Nothing is ever small that is lived in union with him. Let us listen to the words of Jesus. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Matthew 10.42 Yes, in Christ, the smallest act of service takes on eternal value. United with him, even the humblest existence becomes fruitful for the kingdom of God. Like Keturah, let us confidently welcome the part that the Lord desires to entrust to us. 
Let us offer him what we are, however limited. In the simplicity of heart, let us listen to the Holy Spirit to discern how God wants to use us. Where the human eye sees only weakness, the divine gaze already contemplates the wonder he can accomplish in us and through us. Let us dare to have confidence. Let us meditate on Keturah, the figure of Keturah, a humble and discreet woman, yet oh so precious to God's plan. May her example help us also welcome the unique mission that the Lord desires to entrust to us. May we move forward with confidence and joy on the path before us, never discouraged. After meditating on the discreet figure of Keturah and the role God entrusted to her, let us now try to shed light on some more mysterious aspects related to this woman. Indeed, Scripture remains very elliptical about her origins and exact identity. Numerous questions have animated biblical commentators over the centuries. Let us examine them prudently, in a spirit of humble and confident inquiry. First, a recurrent debate concerns the possibility that Keturah is in fact just another name for Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant who bore Abraham a son named Ishmael. Let us briefly recall the biblical account. After years of sterility, Sarai, Abram's wife, gave him her maidservant Hagar as a concubine to bear him a child. Hagar conceived a son whom Abram named Ishmael, Genesis 16. But later, Sarai, now Sarah, became jealous of Hagar and asked Abraham to banish her and her son. God then allowed this painful trial, Genesis 21. Now, Keturah appears in the biblical narrative only after Sarah's death, as Abraham's new wife and mother of six sons. Hence the question, might Keturah not be Hagar returned to Abraham after Sarah's death? Several clues can suggest this. First, Hagar and Keturah are never mentioned together, and Hagar's subsequent fate remains unknown after she was dismissed at Sarah's behest. Moreover, the very name Keturah means incense, perfume, or perfumed in Hebrew. It could be an honorific title given to Hagar upon her return as a reward for her faithfulness. Some church fathers, like John Chrysostom, already defended this position. For them, there was no doubt that Hagar, after a period of trial, was reintegrated into Abraham's household under the name Keturah in a spirit of reconciliation and unity. However, other exegetes stress that nothing in the biblical text formally identifies Hagar with Keturah. Their children are also different, which seems incompatible with the idea that they are the same person. Moreover, this would be the only occurrence in the Bible of a character completely changing identity. Therefore, lacking scriptural certainty, the identification of Keturah with Hagar can only remain at the stage of an attractive but unverifiable hypothesis. The exegetical debate remains open between the proponents of both positions. When in doubt, it is best not to decide too quickly what escapes our knowledge. However, whether Keturah is Hagar or another woman, the theological meaning remains the same. This second-rank wife symbolizes the divine election that can knock on every door, even those one would not expect. She inaugurates a posterity of blessing broader than legitimate descent. In this sense, her identity matters less than the promise she carries. Another mysterious aspect about Keturah. The Bible remains silent about her origins, race and people. Again, hypotheses have abounded over the centuries to fill this scriptural silence. Let us try to discern some of them without forgetting the limits of speculation. A first conceivable lead is that Keturah too came from the region of Canaan like Sarah, Abraham's first wife. Before his calling, Abram did indeed live among the Canaanites. He could thus have chosen Keturah from that same people. Others think of a close but distinct origin, such as the Arameans, but other exegetes prefer a Middle Eastern provenance. Keturah may have come from the Arabian Peninsula, home to some of her sons like the Midianites. Her covenant would then mark the entry of the peoples of that region into the blessing of Abraham. Several church fathers, like Augustine, believe Keturah may have come from even more distant lands, like Ethiopia or southern Egypt. Her posterity would thus evoke the universality of salvation in Jesus Christ, extending to all humanity. Finally, as we saw above, the very name Keturah means incense or perfume in Hebrew. Some deduce from this an origin tied to spice-producing regions like Arabia or Yemen, 
Here again, this remains at the level of conjecture. Some exegetes and theologians, since the early Christian centuries, have proposed the idea that Keturah may have been a black-skinned woman of African origin. This hypothesis relies in particular on the fact that several of the sons Keturah bore to Abraham have names associated in the Bible with southern peoples, potentially black in skin. This is the case with Midian, ancestor of the Midianites, located by some in northwestern Arabia, linked to African populations. Already in the 4th century, St. John Chrysostom saw Keturah as an Ethiopian, that is, a woman from Nubia, a region located south of ancient Egypt. According to him, Keturah would thus be a wife from the nations, as opposed to the legitimate matriarch Sarah from the chosen people. More recently, some contemporary exegetes also associate Keturah with the Kushites, a Nubian people presented as black-skinned in the Bible. Her covenant with Abraham would announce the future integration of the African nations into the divine blessing. Although attractive, this hypothesis of a black Keturah remains however unverifiable and purely conjectural, as the Bible provides no explicit information on Keturah's skin color. Some even criticize it as an anachronistic projection of modern racial categories onto an ancient text. In any case, the debate around a possible African origin for Keturah shows that this mysterious figure has always been associated with a universal divine election, going beyond the framework of the chosen people alone to encompass all of humanity. At the end of this overview, we must concede that Keturah's ethnic origins remain obscure due to the lack of scriptural details. But is the essential not elsewhere? More than a specific race, Keturah represents an unexpected divine election, a grace of integration offered beyond the usual boundaries. Her mysterious identity reflects the universality of revelation. Thus, Keturah's person remains surrounded by shadowy areas that have stimulated exegetical reflection, but resist our categories. It is an invitation to humility. God's word retains aspects that escape our understanding. Scripture does not yield up all its riches all at once, we must progress patiently without forcing the texts into ready-made frameworks. Let us therefore be cautious with hazardous theories, but let us also welcome these biblical mysteries as a call to continually explore the treasures of revelation. The Holy Spirit gradually introduces us to the understanding of Scripture if we approach it with a humble and docile heart. Full clarity will be given to us in the heavenly Jerusalem when we see God face to face. In the meantime, let us walk in the light offered to us, giving thanks. After this reflection on the enigma represented by Keturah, let us now turn our hearts to the Lord Jesus. In meditating on this mysterious figure, we indeed touch the limits of our investigative abilities. The more we delve into scripture, the more the mystery grows, sending us back to our condition as creatures before their creator. Only Christ is the key that fully unlocks the treasures of revelation. He, the incarnate word, who reveals the ultimate meaning of all scripture. He, who is the wisdom and the truth come down into our night. If Keturah partly eludes us, Christ rendered himself totally knowable by becoming one of us. As the prologue to the Gospel of John states, No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. John 1.18 Yes, any meditation on the Old Testament must refer us to Christ who is its keystone, its heart, its summit. He is the culmination of all sacred history. Let us contemplate him ceaselessly. Let us listen to these other words from John's prologue. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 1.17 all the mystery of Keturah, the whole revelation of the Old Testament, is but figure and preparation for the full manifestation of God in Jesus, the Word made flesh for our salvation. Beloved, let us be fascinated by this mystery of crazy love, God making himself near, coming out from his inaccessibility to make himself visible, tangible, knowable in Jesus Christ. The infinite God makes himself a small child, the unfathomable takes on a human face. The uncreated light enters into our darkness. Such is the good news, the heart of our faith. 
Yes, on this day let us praise, bless, adore the Lord for the priceless gift of the Incarnation. What undeserved grace! My friends, humble Keturah sends us back to Christ who alone fully satisfies our thirst for truth. Meditating on Scripture makes us yearn for Him who is its living fulfillment. Praised be you, Lord Jesus. Glory to you who came to share our human condition. You are the way, the truth and the life. In you are revealed the promises of the Old Covenant. You are the light that illuminates Scripture and makes it come alive for our salvation. Blessed are you, crucified love who ceaselessly gives yourself. Amen.